of that truth, don't we? We're almost home. Because of what Jesus has done, he has uh, rescued us, saved us, and has preparing, uh, is preparing a place for us to be with him for all eternity. If you have your Bibles, we're going to sing, we're going to uh, not sing, I uh, just did that. We're going to uh, look at part of the text that uh, is used in that song from Philippians chapter 3. And uh, we're going to look at verses 12 through uh, chapter 4. And as you're turning there, um, I want to show you a couple pictures. Um, and uh, the first one, well, they're both the same picture, but this is uh, Half Dome uh, in Yosemite uh, National Park uh, in California. Uh, any ever, anybody ever been there? Yeah, there's quite a few of you. Okay, so, um, so this is Half Dome. This is probably looking somewhere around Little Yosemite Valley toward, this is the famous uh, picture. Um, if you've ever seen it in black and white, it's Ansel Adams that did this. Um, and so this is Half Dome. Now, the, uh, what you can do at Half Dome is there's a little campground that's on the other side of that mountain. You see where it slopes down? There's a campground at the bottom of that and uh, called Little Yosemite uh, Campground. And you can stay there overnight and uh, get to uh, uh, wrestle with the bears that come through at night. Um, and, and it's real fun and, all, and exciting, keeps you up all night. Um, and so, but then after that, there is a way that you can climb to the top of Half Dome. So this is the next picture, okay? So this is the climb that you can do to Half Dome. I didn't realize this, but uh, this is one of the top six uh, most dangerous hikes in America. Now, when I was uh, 20 years old, um, I climbed that. Now, but don't, don't, don't give me credit yet, guys, because you're like, well, that's pretty cool. Well, it wasn't as a 20-year-old that hates heights, and I, as I'm standing there with my cousin, we're at the bottom, at the very bottom of this thing, looking up, and it just looks, it's not obviously straight up, but it looks straight up to someone who does not like heights. And so I'm thinking, he, he's got his gloves on, there's a pile of gloves, you put your gloves on right there, and, and he's got those on, and he's ready to go. And I've got my gloves in my hand, and I'm looking up, and I keep looking down, I'm looking up, and I'm like, dude, I, there is no way that I'm going to do this. And so I'm him hauling around for like 10 minutes about, you know, there's no way I'm going to do this, this is dangerous. And as I'm talking, and I'm not lying, as I'm talking, this six or seven year old girl literally runs right between us, grabs the gloves, and she just takes off. <laughs> and I said, well, I guess I don't have an excuse now, right? So I, I, I did it, and, th and that was a wonderful thing to do. Um, but he, Paul Stoltz, in his book, Adversity Quotient, he says a person's adversity quotient has a greater influence on his success than his intelligence, education, or social skills. So why is it that when we are faced with adversity, some people just give up, yet some people seem to just rise above that? Like it doesn't matter to them, like that six-year-old girl. Uh, why is it that when following Jesus, and it gets hard sometimes, people want to give up, rather than just lean into it and move forward. Well, he calls this, there are three types of people, quitters, campers, and climbers. Quitters are quitters who see a mountain, much like I wanted to do, and just give up. Uh, that's, I'm not gonna do that. They abandon the, uh, what God has called them to do, and they wanna take the easier path. The path with less adversity. Maybe they think, man, this, I thought this Christian thing was going to be a lot easier than this. All my problems are not solved. Life is still hard. I thought it was, I was going to feel better about everything. And so I just, well, I'm just going to go home and this is not for me. And then there's campers. Campers see a mountain and, and yet they may start a little bit, but they quickly settle down. They want to camp out. They begin that climb, but it gets, it gets tough. It's, it's weary uh, some, and then they just look for a place to settle. This is what we call comfortable Christianity, right? It's, it's that I'm going to just sort of build my comfort zone around me. I can control all these things. Look how much God is blessing me. Obviously, I must be doing what God's called me to do because look at all the things that God's doing for me. And so there's this comfortability factor there. And then there's other followers of Jesus who are the climbers. They see a mountain like this, and they just grab their gear. They don't shrink back. They move forward in that. They don't quit. They don't settle down. They don't give up. They don't give in. In fact, they dig into what God has already done for them, and they move forward. No matter how difficult it may be, they face adversity, and they move forward in their walk with Jesus. What we see today in this text 
is the Apostle Paul's life was one ascent after another. When Jesus radically changed Paul's life on the road to Damascus, it was to begin a journey. And when you gave your life and heart to Jesus, just like I did, we began a journey. We began a race. God put us on that course to run that race. In Paul's journey, it was filled with adversity. He was uh, almost stoned to death. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was ran out of most towns that he got to. He's imprisoned even while writing this text here in Philippians. But in the midst of it all, Paul was filled with joy, even in the midst of adversity. So make no mistake, we're on a race. If you are in Christ, you have been saved. You are on a race, and there will be suffering. Jesus told us that. There will be adversity. Jesus had it, and so we will too. This should not surprise you or me. But even in the midst of the adversity, there is joy in the journey. So how can we have joy in our journey? That's our big question for this morning. How can I have joy when I'm faced with adversity? How can I learn not to just quit or to to settle down or to camp out? But how do I move on in my progress of what God is calling me to do? Well, this is what we see and what I want to show you in Philippians 3, starting in verse 12. Follow along with me there. Hear the word of the Lord. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him to subject all things to Himself. Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. There are three steps that I see outlined in our text this morning that will enable us, if we will lean into these, if we will believe God's word enough to put these into action in our life, they will help us to have joy in, the, in our journey, no matter how difficult it may be at times. Look at the first one. It's found in verses 12 through 16. These are pretty simple outlines today, or this outline's really simple today. Um, press on. Press on. So he says in verse 12 through 13 there, he writes, press on twice. Two times, Paul writes, press on. So what does it mean to press on? Well, it means, first and foremost, to keep pursuing Christ, to keep pursuing Christ's likeness, to keep on keeping on. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't give in. Keep moving forward. So don't uh, uh, don't quit. I press on, Paul says. Paul's not going to let anything deter him from the pursuit of becoming like Christ in his death and resurrection. He wants Christ's power to be at work in him to resemble the work of Christ in him more than anything else in the world. And nothing, no shipwreck, no beaten, no imprisonment, nothing is going to deter Paul from following Christ at all cost. And neither should it for us as well. But we have to ask the why question. Did Paul know something that we don't? Well, maybe. Maybe we'll learn that right now. So what, why should we press on? Well, we see this in the next verse. We press on that we have not because we have not arrived yet. Paul says that but I, not that I have already attained this in verse 12, but, or am already perfect, but I press on. So if Paul, who is an apostle here, 
a leader of the church, has been sent out by the church to start other churches. And the guy who was radically converted by Jesus himself in this wonderful event on the Damascus Road, who also wrote half the New Testament, who also took the gospel all the way to Rome, who preached the gospel and all kinds of dignitaries and things like that. If this guy here says, I haven't arrived yet, then guess what? Chances are we haven't either, right? No, we haven't. He, he's pressing on. Why? Because we have not arrived yet. The problem here is that apathy and pride tend to deter us from following Jesus at all costs. And we don't have to be apathetic. We don't have time to be apathetic because there is way too much that needs to be done in us. If we would take a good look in ourselves, there is way too much that Jesus needs to do in us if we, to, for us to be apathetic to what he wants us to do in this world. But not only that, but our pride gets in the way too. Unless we look at ourselves through what the Bible shows us as ourselves, sinners in need of God's grace every single day, unless we see that, then I think, well, I don't have anything to, for God to change. I'm good. Just look at, you know, I'm better than this guy. I'm better than this girl. I mean, I don't do all those things. You're comparing yourself to the wrong person. I'm comparing myself to the wrong person. We're not to look like everybody else. We're not to look like Jesus, right? So we compare ourselves with Jesus. And so Paul says, press on, because you haven't arrived yet. And so, but there's, there, there's this idea that, that we can press on because we have the power to press on. Look at the second one there, the next phrase. We can press on because why? We belong to Jesus. We belong to Jesus. He says, because Christ has made me his own. If Jesus saved you, listen to this, if Jesus saved you, then you belong to Jesus. You belong to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 16, 19, and 20. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. He paid for you on the cross. So glorify God in your body. Jesus purchased every believer by his blood that he shed on the cross. He paid our sin debt. Every part of you, every part of me was paid for by Jesus. Your eyes, Jesus bought. Your hands, Jesus died for. Your mind, Jesus wants to redeem. Your whole body, Jesus paid for everything. He purchased all of you. The problem that we see oftentimes is people come to Jesus and they want him to do a lease program instead of a purchasing program, right? Jesus, I can give you this much of my life, but this over here, I'm going to hold that back for myself. Jesus is not interested in leasing any part of you. He wants to purchase all of you, every aspect of who you are. And when he does, it gives us the power, the Holy Spirit comes in us, and it gives us his power to keep pressing on no matter what. So we can press on because we belong to Jesus, but we also can press on in the very next verse, in verse 14, because we want to glorify God. Paul says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul's using this athletic imagery, this race imagery. He does that in several other letters. And, and he's talking about this, the winner of the Greek games would often get a reef uh, and, a, and a cash prize given to him. And, and then, but yet we know that Paul's not talking about necessarily a cash prize or a reef here or a crown. But what he's talking about is that his goal here is Jesus' goal for him. Jesus' goal for every single one of us, Paul, me, or anybody else that has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, his goal for us is to use our entire body bodies to keep pressing on to bring glory to the Lord, to bring glory to Him. So how do we press on? We've seen what and why, and we want to know how we press on. He says, brothers, the next verse, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining. Again, that's another, you know, you see that runner's neck out, wanting to cross the finish line, straining forward to what lies ahead. So on the one hand, Paul here says he's pressing on by forgetting what lies behind. He's going to forget how he may have treated Christians before he met Jesus. Maybe he's, he's wanting to forget how, of a, uh, how immature of a believer, how some things he had gotten wrong at some point in his, his, his uh, uh, early uh, uh, conversion. Maybe he's wanting to forget how he messed up maybe yesterday, Romans 7, right? 
Or maybe it's even forgetting the accomplishments that he made yesterday. Forgetting here, though, doesn't have the idea of not remembering. It's this right here. It's not allowing the past to dictate my present and my future. Paul refuses here to live in the past. Paul is not relishing the past of his past glories, but he's also not letting the past difficulties and the past uh, 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 um, problems deter him from following Christ in the present. He keeps pursuing Christ in the present. His past doesn't deter him from that, good or bad. And we have to ask that question, right? Are you allowing things that have happened yesterday to deter you from pursuing Christ today? Whether it was good and some accomplishment that you did, maybe you won somebody to the Lord one day, but maybe that was a long time ago. Don't let that one accomplishment keep you from doing what God's calling you to do today. Or it could be that you messed up big time years ago. Don't let the, the failure and the mistake keep you from pursuing Christ today. We have to strive to pursue Christ. And we're not motivated out of guilt, we're motivated out of grace, right? We don't pursue Christ from guilt, but from gratitude. We pursue Christ. And let me finish up the 15 and uh, the, the verse 15 and 16 there. But yet, on the other hand, Paul says we have to be honest about where we are spiritually, though. He says, Let those of you who are mature think this way. And if you think, if anything, in anything you think otherwise, God reveal, will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. What is he talking about there? He's talking about, look, an infant in Christ cannot be expected to act like a seasoned seminary professor. Just as no more than an infant, we would expect an infant to be born and then go get a job. Just not going to happen. And that's okay. But the expectation is that there is going to be growth. The expectation is that there is pursuit of holiness. The expectation is that I want to do what God has called me to do now that he's changed my life. So there is an expectation that you don't have to be further along in your journey than where you actually are, but you are to be pursuing Christ. And whatever area you are in your pursuit of Christ, do it. That's what he says. Hold true to what you have attained, to what you have already learned. The things that you learn in Sunday school, don't let them go in one ear and out the other. Do what you learn in Sunday school and that God's word points us to. And then as we do that, we hold true to what we have attained because there's joy in the journey when we press on in Christ. Now, the second aspect is only one verse. The second step that we could take, that we could believe to begin to take that, is found in verse 17, that we want to follow godly examples. Follow godly examples. Look at verse 17 with me. He says, Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Now, if you're reading this as a good Bible student, right, and you're thinking, there should be this huge question mark at the beginning when you read verse 17. And it's, it's this, did Paul really say imitate him? Did he really say, hey guys, I want you to imitate me? I thought we were supposed to be imitating Jesus. Is Paul just that spiritually arrogant? Is he that spiritually presumptuous? Does he really have it all together that he wants other people just to follow him? Is he really saying, hey, if you want to know about Christianity, then watch me? Well, he is. <laughs> so, he is, but there's a reason why he is. 1 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17 he writes this all over his letters, by the way. I just picked a few. I urge you, he says to the church in Corinth, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. Here it is, to remind you of my ways in Christ. As I teach them everywhere and in every church. 1 Corinthians 11, he, he, he summarizes this even more for us. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And then later in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And here's the result. And the God of peace will be with you. So there's a lot of others, but I think you get the point. Paul here is writing follow me because I'm following Christ. Now you talk about up in the accountability chart. When you step, you step out and you say, watch me 
if you want to know how to follow Jesus. And in fact, I'll go so far to say it's not, um, it is unbiblical as mature followers of Jesus if we don't tell people that. If we don't say, watch me as I follow Jesus, we're not actually following Paul's prescription or description in the Bible about what a discipling relationship looks like. We all need people that are pouring into us, and we need to in turn pour into others along in, along in their journey. In fact, uh, there, you know, I was kind of going to hold this, but I'll do it right now. There's this new book that we got in called My New Life. If you have given your life to Jesus over the last two years, I haven't been here quite two years yet, but, but if you've given your life to Jesus in the last two years, chances are nobody has come to you and said, hey, I want to walk with you to teach you how to follow Jesus. This is a brand new life that he saved you to live, and I want you to know how to do this by watching me and let me help you do that. If that's you, at the end of this service, and I'll try to remember to do this again at the end uh, to remind you, but I have about 10 of these books. I want you to come get one of those books, and I want you to find someone. If you, if you haven't found it, I will put somebody with you to walk with you through this book to help you learn how to live this new life in Christ. It's just called A New Christian's Guide to Building Your Life on God's Word, um, and you need this, and we need to pour into you. We talk about discipleship all the time around here. Here's a great way to do that. So we are committed to making disciples who make disciples. We are committed to taking new believers and seeing them grow. We are committed because the Bible is committed to say, hey, new believer, young Christian, watch me if you want to learn how to follow Jesus. And I pray that there's going to be more in here willing to say that than just, you know, a handful. But we'll bless God for whatever we have there. So let me, let me move on. There's joy in the journey when we follow godly examples. The third area here. He says, stand firm. So we press on, we follow godly examples, and then we stand firm. Look at uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. So to stand firm here means to stand and then to keep standing. And then to keep saying, no matter what, you stand. Just like that post in the concrete that Levy talked about, we are to stand no matter what. We are never expected, though, to stand firm on our own resources and our, in our own strength. What does Paul say? Read it there. Stand firm thus how? In the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord. How do we stand firm in the Lord? We, standing firm means that we don't waver. We, we believe what God's promises and we dive into God's word. We, we cultivate that relationship with him through our prayer life. We share him with others. We grow with others in Bible study and in and, and, and learning Christ's word. We progress on together. We stand firm. This is not a defensive standing, by the way. This is not like the onslaught of the enemy is hitting us and we're not moving. No, the Bible is always in an offensive manner. It's always moving forward. The kingdom of God, you cannot stop. That's why Jesus said, Matthew 16, 18, the gates of hell will not prevail against the gospel. God's kingdom will continue to grow. So this is not a, I'm just going to bear it up as much as I can until I can't anymore. No, this is a stand firm in the truth of God's word, so move forward. Remember, he's talking about pressing on, not backing up, not just digging our heels in, but we dig into the the, the root of God's word. We dig into what God's word says, and we push forward. No matter what, no matter the adversity, no matter the difficulty, no matter what's going on in our life, God is not minimizing those things, but he has a heavenly perspective. He has an eternal perspective of those things. So nevertheless, we move forward in his power and in his strength. So stand firm in the Lord. All right. I skipped over some verses, and I did not mean, I mean, I I meant to, I did not accidentally to. We're going to go back to these. I wanted to save these few verses till the end. Look at verse 18, starting there. He's putting this with the the idea of um, following godly examples, but I wanted to pull this out just to give it its, its own special spot here, um, and I think you'll see why. 
Because as we try to press on, and, and I believe that all believers today want to press on. I believe that that's in our, we, we want to keep moving forward, but it's like every inch we get, we feel like we take two yards back. And, and we understand that. But nevertheless, the Bible still calls us to move forward, to press on, to follow those godly examples, and to stand firm. And so in this, we're, we're inundated and, and if, you're, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm glad that you're here. Um, and you need to hear this. You do. Um, this is truth from God's Word. But we're told all the time about finding your path and, and, and stick to your path. And there's all kind of paths in life and, and blah, 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 blah. But according to the Bible, there are only two paths in this life. There are only two paths. One leads to destruction and one leads to life. That's all. That's all that there is. There are no multiple paths, uh, if you're counting multiples as more than two, <laughs> okay? So the only multiple path is there's a path that leads to destruction, a path that leads to life. And Paul talks about that here. Look at verse 18. He says, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, we don't know who he's talking about here. Uh, it could be that uh, he's talking about antinomianism. That just means that people are saying that, look, there's so much of God's grace, you can do whatever you want, and it's okay because it's been paid for. And, and it could be that. It, so these could be you know, so-called Christians, um, or it could be just general lost people. I don't know. But what we know is what, how he describes them, is that, number one, they're enemies of the cross of Christ, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So everyone in this room and around the world is headed to one destination, to eternity. Every single person is headed to eternity. The difference here is the end result. So while the world is headed in one direction, God's people is headed in another direction. So here for the world, we see that they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. That means ruin. So if you want to ruin your life, then keep following what you hear from the world. How does the world preach its message? Well, we hear it all the time. Just turn the TV on. Um, sex sells, right? So look at advertisements. If you want to know how to ruin your life, then follow what you hear in songs that are not God-honoring songs. If you want to know how to ruin your life, then follow that Instagram person that makes you want to feel like them. Man, I want to be as popular as I want to be as accepted as them. You know, if you want to ruin your life, then follow what you see in all social media, in every area of life that is not committed to honoring the Lord. That is how you ruin your life, according to this word here. Keep living that way, and it will lead to destruction. Jesus talks about that. Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. Most of the world is headed to destruction right now. Most of the world is headed to an eternity without Jesus. 2 Peter 3, 7, Peter even says that. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. What does that even mean? Does that mean they're given over to gluttony? Well, not to food, but to sin, yes. They have an appetite. They are gluttonous for sin. They have an appetite, an insatiable desire to do life without God, to do life on on their own, to not consult the Lord Jesus about anything, to do and make decisions, whatever benefits that person. They can't get enough of themselves, their lives, and whatever it is they want to do. Their glory, or they glory in their shame, that means that they love to make much of their sin. They love to glorify their sin. They love to glorify their sinful lifestyles. And they live to teach it to others. They celebrate their sin. They want others to celebrate it with them. And they put as much spotlight on their sinful lifestyle as they can. And then they are focused on earthly things. Everything they do is for the here and now with no thought of what comes after death. They want to seize the day, so to speak. And if that is you this morning, number one, I am so, so glad that God brought you here. Because that is true of you. If you know that when you die, if you were to walk out of this building and die, you know that there is no way that I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus. 
I may know who he is, but he sure does not know me. If that is you, this can change in the twinkling of an eye. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Here it is. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God is not waiting for you to get your act together and then come to him. God is not waiting for you to turn over a new leaf or to quit doing some habitual sin that has got you caught up. God's not waiting for any of those things. God is waiting for you to come to Jesus, and then he'll save you. But you have to come to Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for you. That blood that he shed was for you to give you this salvation, this new life, complete and whole forgiveness of sins. And if you want Jesus to save you, in just a few moments, we're going to have a a time of uh, response, and I'm going to encourage you to come on down and step out from where you are. But those who have been saved by the blood of Jesus, we have a different destination, a different goal. Verse 20 and 21, he says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to even subject all things to himself. There's a lot to be said in these two verses, but here's the one thing that I want you to hear. We don't think about this very much, church family, but I want you to hear this. Please, please notice what Paul does not say. And then I want you to notice what he does say specifically because it will change your journey. He says, our citizenship is where? In heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. From it, that's heaven, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible never, ever teaches that heaven is your goal. Not one time will you ever find the Bible teaching that that heaven is your goal. You can look for it, but you're not going to find it. Your goal and my goal is Jesus himself. We aren't looking for a place. We're looking for a person that occupies that place. His name is Jesus. I know that when we talk to little kids and, and we, we hear the gospel being shared and, you know, we, we, wanna, we don't, I mean, who does want to go to hell? I mean, when they die, nobody, right? So we, we kind of language it up of, if you want to go to heaven, then you need Jesus. Well, can I say one thing here? In all love and honesty, a place did not die for you on the cross. Jesus did. If you came to Jesus because it was only about heaven, then you need to come back to Jesus again because it's about him. And there's all kinds of people in here today, and I don't know everybody's individual walk, but I can guarantee you there is a handful of people, and probably more than that, that gave your life, or I'm going to put that in quotes, you were saved just so that you can go to heaven. Whether Jesus was there or not, that'd be great that he's there, but I really just want to be not in hell, (laughs) so I wanted heaven. If that's you, please re-examine your heart. Please come to faith in Christ. Jesus and Jesus alone can save you. That's what Paul's getting at here. In Jesus, we can press on. In Jesus, we can follow other godly examples who are following Jesus. In Jesus, we can stand firm in his word. Our citizenship is secured in heaven, not because of heaven itself, but because of the one who occupies heaven, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you so much for dying on the cross for our sins. We thank you for giving your life to us. So God, we want to do that as well. We want to give our life to you. Father, for those that don't know you, have never known you as Lord, God, I pray that you are calling them to yourself and that they would respond in faith and repentance, that they would turn their back on sin and turn their face toward the Lord Jesus, and that they would put their, their full trust in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning for the salvation of their soul. For others, Lord, that have been just maybe playing a game for years and years and years, God, would you show them their heart, the real condition of their heart, God, and that they would repent and and place their trust 
in Jesus and Jesus alone. May they not put their trust in anything else, God, but it would be Jesus. And for those of us who are following you that we know where we're gonna be for eternity because we wanna spend an eternity with the one who has loved us enough to die for us. God, help us to teach other younger believers that. Help us to step up in faith. Even if we've never discipled someone, help us to step up in faith and empower and enable us to take a younger believer, whether it's a child of ours or someone else in this church or in our life. God, help us to teach others how to follow you. Lord, we love you, and we ask that you would um, have your way in our time of response, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's it.